My name is Brett Lodge and I'm the Managing Director of Subnet. Today, I'm going to go through a few of the common questions we get asked by our clients and by the industry. Let's focus on a few of those. Uh, number one, quite often we're getting uh, customers talk to us about cyber insurance uh, and what they're doing about cyber insurance, whether that's coming up with a new insurance policy or whether it's doing a policy renewal and quite often we'll talk about, uh, I guess, the level of detail we're seeing in that. Secondly, we're often getting calls and talks about um, from a, uh, I guess, an IT manager talking about what their boss is asking and what they're uh, worried about as far as protecting the business from cyber risk. The last one, speaking of risk, uh, we're getting third parties ask a lot of clients about what they're doing about cyber risk and how they're mitigating their risk. Uh, quite often when you're dealing with, uh, with clients, that could be things like um, if you're giving them money or, or if they're giving you money or uh, giving you um, information, um, that often means that they'll ask what top and level risk you're at. So let's maybe dig into a few of those. Uh, the other one that I'm really hoping is not happening is that uh, you're coming here to try and cure some insomnia. So I'm hoping to keep this brief and uh, we'll see how we go. So let's get into cyber insurance as the first part. I guess the real thing with cyber insurance that we're seeing, um, we've had clients that have come to us just recently with now documents over 60 pages in length just for a renewal. Uh, and these documents quite often have a lot of technical jargon. Uh, they have a lot of uh, legal jargon uh, and they're needing a lot of help to be able to cover that off. I guess the, the big things that we're finding um, with regards to cyber insurance is obviously in the market, uh, and you all have seen this over the last few years, uh, is that a number of uh, cyber insurance claims are really going through the roof. Um, in the last two or three years, especially since COVID hit, um, we're seeing that as a major shift in uh, people trying to attack businesses. Uh, and then that in turn obviously increasing the, uh, the number of breaches that are happening. Second, we're seeing, I guess, even small claims are really between twenty dollars and $50,000 um, for something that's relatively inconsequential. Uh, the reason that adds up is because of things like uh, insurance companies using their own specialist advisors, and that obviously adds a lot of dollars pretty quickly, as well as a lot of the mitigation tasks that you need to implement when you're using uh, cyber insurance. So uh, we've seen quite often businesses do things like uh, automatically implement um, endpoint detection and response over and above things like uh, antivirus, and we'll talk about what that is later, uh, but that's certainly something that adds to the cost of the, uh, the engagement and why it basically adds up so quickly. With those two things, the number of breaches going up and the cost of the breach, uh, each breach going up, that also then means overall that cyber insurance is also going up. Um, so premiums, we've seen anything from a two to four times multiplier uh, in 12 months without seeing a massive difference in coverage. Um, so that is certainly uh, the three biggest things and obviously uh, if you're being asked, uh, or if you're seeing things like um, uh, increased premiums from your cyber insurer, uh, this is typically why. Okay, what about the boss? So again, if you're in the IT manager role, um, you quite often find uh, they'll, uh, business will kind of uh, assess the level of risk that they think they have within the business, and that then flows down to uh, you as the IT manager or the person in the IT team. So why would the bosses be asking for that? Um, from our point of view, we're seeing a few different things. Number one, I guess one of the main things we've seen um, is one of the uh, recent court cases that uh, has come up in the last few weeks. Um, this was a court case for a company that happened to be a financial advisory firm. They had an IT uh, management firm that were helping support them. They provided a lot of uh, ideas around increasing uh, their cybersecurity status, um, implementing new tools. At this point, the uh, exec team in that uh, financial advisory decided not to go forward with it, and that uh, ended up getting a breach happen. Now, as part of that breach uh, with the notifiable data information that had to go to the government, um, that ended up going through the courts, and the courts have now just acknowledged that uh, or held the execs and the board uh, directly liable uh, for that breach, uh, and so that started impacting them financially. Um, so you can't get away with just hoping for the best, you really do need to prepare. So that's one part of it. Uh, the other part from that, uh, I guess moving up a stage uh, from a director's and a board point of view more specifically, uh, something that came out a few years ago, which hopefully everyone understands, uh, is the fact that boards now need to uh, be able to uh, acknowledge and notify on the case of a PII, or Personally Identifiable Information Breach. Essentially that's a breach where you have either leaked some client data or some staff data, um, like we've seen recently in the SA government uh, breach around payroll. So obviously very embarrassing um, having to notify a whole heap of clients or a whole heap of staff around why you've lost their data. Uh, but also there's a lot of dollars involved uh, from a boss point of view um, around fines, uh, which can add up pretty quickly, both directly for the boss 
and also for the uh, the company. So that's certainly something to be aware of and that's certainly something we're seeing uh, from a, uh, an executive level is something that's worrying most of them. The last one that we are starting to see, uh, which is kind of an extension of that notifiable data breach, is around legislation changes. Uh, so we are starting to see now where the government is starting to crack down on things like ransomware payment. So if you do get breached uh, for a ransomware, um, this can impact you because you in future may need to report to the government how much money you've paid out and what you've paid it out for. Um, so again, really tightening that, but that can cause embarrassment as well as um, getting out to your customers that you've had breaches, uh, which then impacts the long-term sales of your business. So again, very understandable why bosses would be concerned. The last one that I'll talk through um, and give you some advice on, I guess, is what we're seeing around standards and risk. Um, so often nowadays, third parties are really concerned if they're lending you either money or, or you're, they're lending you or providing you information that you're maintaining it securely and you have that un, uh, one under wraps as far as how you're managing your business. Now at the enterprise level, quite often people will go through like we have personally, uh, we've done ISO 27001 compliance, that's about to be ISO 27002, and that's a framework for information security. Uh, what we're finding though is as a, as a tangent to that, um, places like you know, Tenders SA, recently the local government authority in South Australia for, for local councils, and um, large corporates are asking specifically for custom, uh, companies to fill in large risk assessment documents. They're basically third party vendor risk. Each of those documents kind of wants you to align to something like the Australian government's ASD Essential 8. And using that policy and using that process, the Essential 8 will give you, uh, I guess, a good starting point um, to, I guess, understand where you are today and what you need to do to kind of mitigate that risk. So hopefully that covers off a lot of stuff that we're seeing in the market. Now, more importantly, how do you fix that? And what we'll do is we'll catch you in part two and cover off those.